in our next lesson on protein structure from chapter 4, we want to look more at the subject of protein folding and at our last level of protein structure, quaternary structure. Remember from our last lesson, we found that the instructions for the proper fold of that protein into both the secondary and tertiary form has to do with the sequence of amino acids. Which amino acids are present and in which positions uh, are they found? And this allows the protein to fold spontaneously. So the question is, does it ever misfold? And that does occur. Sometimes there are changes in pH or ion concentration or temperature. And remember also that the cell is a very busy place and there could be other factors that interfere in this process. And so we find that there are molecular chaperones that are present to help that protein fold properly, to refold. One of the most prominent examples is the GROEL GROES complex. So let's look at that. At the top of the screen here we see the barrel shaped structure of GROEL. This is actually composed of two heptameric rings seven subunits in each of those rings and the two rings are placed on top of one another. You can see that a little bit better if you look at the lower left here. So these are our two ring structures placed on top of one another. And the protein to be folded fits within that barrel structure. Before the protein binds, however, here's our Groyel barrel at the top. Each one of those subunits is going to bind an ATP molecule and we can see that there's a slight conformational change when it does so. Our protein then fits within the barrel of GROEL and then we put this cap, GROES, on top of it and that is the trigger to allow this protein to refold. If you look at the lower right, this is a view down the center of that GROEL-GROES complex. So this allows misfolded proteins to fold properly and prevents their aggregation. I would point out, however, all this barrel structure does is give the protein a protected environment in which it can fold itself. The instructions are still within the protein itself. It just needs a protected environment so that it can be given the chance to fold properly. We'll return to this subject of molecular chaperones later in the semester. We mention it here just to emphasize the importance of protein folding and also uh, we want to look next at what happens if we don't correct this problem. What happens if the misfolded proteins persist in the cell? Well in that case they can aggregate. Remember these misfolded proteins mean they have more exposed hydrophobic regions and that properly folded protein most of those hydrophobic regions are going to be in protected environments. It's the hydrophilic residues that are going to be more solvent exposed and if the protein is misfolded we have those exposed hydrophobic regions and just because of that hydrophobic effect there's a tendency for those proteins to aggregate together and associate those like hydrophobic regions. And so this re uh, results in protein deposits. They're called amyloid deposits. It's not really an amyloid but it resembles them and that can lead to certain disease states such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's and what we know as mad cow. The more formal name for that is transmissible spongiform encephalopathy so mad cow is fine. So what's actually happening here? Well in the case that was first discovered it was a prion disease that was found in sheep. It's called scrapie and it is a prion disease. That is, it's simply a case of a misfolded protein. There is no mutation in this protein. It is simply misfolded. So let's look at our illustration here. In this illustration, PRP stands for the prion protein. The superscript C indicates that it's the cellular or normal form and the superscript SC indicates that it's the misfolded or scrapie form. So look at the difference in secondary structure. For our normal form, our cellular form, it's all alpha helical and somewhat globular in shape, but in the misfolded form it's all these beta strands in this more linear form. Again, this is not a mutation, just a misfold. Well, you can see in the normal form it would be difficult for that to aggregate. All those hydrophobic residues are buried and it would be hard to set up any kind of a linear array. However, in the misfolded, more linear form, we can very easily aggregate those. The proteins aggregate and cause these deposits. And of course, if that's occurring in the brain, you have these protein deposits, this is not a healthy state. And so this just emphasizes the importance 
of properly folding proteins and why the cell has those recovery mechanisms to help them refold properly. Another thing to keep in mind about proteins is that they're often processed even after they're made, after they uh, are initially synthesized in the cell in order to reach their final functional form they have to be processed in some way. In some cases there are sequences on the end of that protein they're referred to as signal sequences that simply directs them to a cor correct location within the cell and once it arrives at that location that sequence is clipped off. There are also pro-sequences. This is true for digestive enzymes and that pro-sequence prevents it from being active but when we're ready to activate those enzymes, we clip off that sequence. So the initial amino acid sequence might vary uh, according to the final form. Another way proteins can be processed is that we can add chemical groups. We can uh, use this method to convert them from an active to an inactive form or vice versa. They may also help to stabilize the protein and allow it to interact with other components. In the example here, we've added a phosphate group at the top and here on the bottom right we have an N-acetyl glucosamine that's been added. So proteins can be modified in many ways. Another way in which they can be modified after translation or synthesis is that they may need to associate with a cofactor for function. We're going to see an example of this in chapter 5. Another thing to point out is that even though the protein folds up into a stable conformation, there may be more than one form. Remember, the conditions might alter. And remember, structure always relates to function. So if this protein is serving a dual function, we can use the same protein by just simply having it fold up in one of two different ways. And what we have illustrated here are the two conformations of lymphotactin. So on the left you can see there's some beta strands, but there's also an alpha helix. However, on the right there are all these anti-parallel beta strands. And both of these are stable conformation. They simply serve alternate functions. Finally, we want to look at our last level of protein structure, and that's quaternary structure. Remember, this is only true for those proteins that are composed of more than one polypeptide chain. And it simply describes how those chains are associated in three-dimensional space. Those proteins may be composed of identical subunits. An example here is collagen on the left. It contains three identical subunits and so we refer to that as a homotrimer. In the case of hemoglobin on the right there are four subunits, so it's a tetramer, and there are two different subunits. There are two of each type, so it's essentially a dimer of dimers, but because it's composed of different subunits we call it a heterotetramer. I would just point out in this illustration the subunits are differently colored just to illustrate their relationship to one another, but there are only two types of subunits and two of each type. So this would be a heterotetramer. Just to point out the difference between a domain and a subunit. Recall from a previous lesson that we could take a single polypeptide chain and it might fold up into two distinct domains, two or more, and each of those domains might serve a distinct function. These are different domains within the same polypeptide chain. However, if they're separate polypeptide chains, they're referred to as subunits, and that would only be true for those that have more proteins that have more than one polypeptide chain, and that gives them a certain quaternary structure. So in our next lesson we want to look at how can we isolate a protein from a mixture of other proteins so that we can study it, and after we've isolated it, how do we determine its primary, secondary, and tertiary structure?